Okay, so let me go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Michael Manella. Um, I work for Pivotal uh, as the project lead for Spring Batch as well as Spring Cloud Task, um, as well as I contribute to a number of other uh, open source projects. Um, I'm an author, speaker, etc. Um, I am also a little self-plug. Um, I'm also on a uh, podcast. It's a pundit podcast called Java Offheap. Um, check it out. It's JavaOffheap.com. Uh, at Offheap on Twitter. Um, but if you're interested in listening to a pundit podcast on, on the Java ecosystem, check us out. I'm also available on Twitter. That's my handle. Everything I'm going to talk about today, all the code for the demos, the deck, everything is available already out on, Git on uh, GitHub. So feel free to check it out. If this is interesting, pull it down, play with it. Give everybody a second to take the pictures. Cool. So quick lay of the land. I think I know where this is going to go, but let me try it anyways. Uh, this is a spring conference, so I'm assuming everybody's comfortable with spring framework in general. Uh, how about spring integration? Show of hands. OK. Spring batch? Cool. Yeah, though. Spring XD, that's kind of what I expected. Spring Cloud Stream, Spring Cloud Task, okay, good. That means I got the right crowd here. And Spring Cloud Dataflow, good. So what are we gonna talk about today? Um, when we talk about uh, the types of projects that, um, that I'm gonna be getting into, we're really talking about data integration and traditional data integration patterns and processes and how those look in a microservices world. Um, if you look at how these applications have been de developed over the past few years, there's been a, a bit of an evolution. Um, the way you develop these types of applications as recently as two or three years ago is probably vastly different than how you would develop them today. A couple of years ago, you probably would have developed these as a monolith. So you're thinking uh, a handful of spring integration uh, flows, maybe a couple of batch jobs, package those up into a war file, deploy it on an app server. If you need to scale that, in any way, you probably end up deploying the same thing to multiple app servers. Um, but as we know, there's a, some problems with this approach. Um, first of all, that, that resulting artifact that you're pushing to those, war that, to those application servers, those tend to become very complex artifacts. So you have a lot of moving parts within each one of those war files, which leads to the problem of them being difficult to test and get eventually from a developer's laptop to production. I've got complex environments to set up. QA on any of these things is, is more complex. And the goal is to get to production. Like, like Josh said, production is, the, is his favorite place on the internet. That is where we want code to be. So anything that impedes the process of getting code from my laptop to production is a problem. It's something we want, we want to avoid. The next step in this evolution was really this big data silver bullet that came through. Um, this is obviously just a small smattering of the logos that uh, are available in this space. Um, and as we all know, just about every other week, there's a new logo that's being added to this slide. Don't get me wrong. These platforms are really good at processing large amounts of data. Um, but where they fall short is, where they pro is with processing small amounts of data or even lots of small pieces of data. So if you have lots of small messages, they don't do very well. They also typically have a very large learning curve. If I want to, let's say, uh, take on uh, writing Spark, Typically, that means I'm also going to have to learn Scala. So now I've got to learn an entire language to learn one of my tools. And chances are that tool isn't going to run in isolation, so I now have to learn the related tools. So there's a very large ramp up for all of my developers uh, to get in, invested into this stack. And then once I've done, once I've climbed, climbed that first mountain, then I've got to do it again and again and again. It, again, let's say I learned Spark, now I want to orchestrate it with something. Let's say I learn uh, Scoop, and I want to orchestrate those jobs with Uzi. I can't take anything I learned from Scoop and apply it to Uzi, as an example. There, there's this new, it, it's like I'm starting over new e for each one of these technologies. And again, you have to learn them all, or a large chunk of them, to be productive in this space. Not only that, but each one of these typically has a very large footprint in my code. If you've ever seen a Spark job, as an example, there's no debating, it's a Spark job. You're not going to rip out a couple annotations and replace it with something else relatively easy. Uh, that your business logic is embedded in there in a way that's very difficult to pull out. Which all leads to the same problems as the complex environments, or the complex artifacts. 
They're hard to test. They're hard to set up. They're hard to get from QA or from your laptop into production. Don't get me wrong. This specific category does have its use. Um, you just have to be aware of what it's good for. These systems were typically, I mean, HGFS came out of uh, a project that was designed to index the internet, the entire thing. So unless you're dealing with a volume of data that's at that scale, you may want to reconsider this kind of architecture. Which leads us to data, data microservices or data processing as microservices. Here we're talking about now about cloud native applications. So this is, these are smaller applications that are, that are following the same 12 factor tenants that uh, you see when you're talking about REST endpoints powering a website. They're developed in, and tested in isolation. So instead of having this monolithic uh, war file that you're pushing to application servers and you have to worry about uh, developing and testing on that entire code base, now we're working on small individual pieces that we can deploy and test and develop individually. That allows them also to be independently scalable. If I have, let's say, a flow that is ingesting data, doing some type of data analytics on it, and then persisting the result, and let's say the data analytics piece is the bottleneck in that process, I can independently scale that one piece as opposed to copying a war file to an application server and pulling up essentially the whole world over and over. The development model is familiar. So if you have Spring developers, which all of you are, it's easy to ramp up on these types of, of microservices. You're already familiar with the annotation-based model that Spring has for all the other, let's say, web components or batch or so forth. Applying those to these new microservice styles is no different. Which brings us to it's small and simple to test. Again, if I'm developing one microservice that's small and easy, or is small and focused, getting that to, for my laptop production is much easier. Finally, they're also operationally easier to govern. So most of the large enterprises I talk to have some type of process involved in getting to production, whether it be a formal QA process, there may be some legal constraints around change control and that type of thing. And what I found is that it, the smaller piece of code you push through that process, the easier it is to get through that process. If I want to change how a file is read, and I, the, the piece of code I'm pushing through is only the reading of a file, that's a whole lot easier than changing how a file is read and then pushing this war file that has the whole world packaged through it. I like to view it as sending my minions out to do my bidding when I, when I look at these types of microservices. In this world, there are two main processing models, streams and tasks, and we'll look at both in just a minute. The last piece of this uh, evolution is data integration as a service. So now instead of focusing on individual microservices, now we're looking at the composition of microservices. Here, streams and flows become my actual application. So an individual microservice by itself probably isn't going to provide any business value. But the composition of those is what actually gives you that business value. At this level, we also typically get or, yeah, or operational and orchestrational coverage. So both uh, monitoring with regards to alerts and, and you know, uh, are things up and down and that kind of thing, as well as orchestrational coverage and the idea that um, I don't have to worry about wiring up the plumbing of microservice A talks to microservice B talks to microservice C with all of the right properties. There's typically something that sits on top of that. This It's more of an abstraction that allows me to do that in a much more easier way. In the Spring world, it looks a little bit like this. Obviously, at the base of everything we do is the Spring framework, and even more core to this is Spring Boot. So everything we're going to talk about today is Spring Boot. Sitting on top of that, we have our workload-specific frameworks. So Spring Integration for message-based uh, microservices and Spring Batch for the batch and finite-style workloads. Sitting on top of those are two new frameworks, Spring Cloud Stream, which is essentially a thin wrapper around Spring integration to provide some niceties to, for building these message-based microservices, and Spring Cloud Task, which is essentially a framework for building finite microservices. Again, we'll look at both of these in just a minute. We'll start off with Spring Cloud Stream. This is a framework designed for building message-based microservices. So if you take, let's say, a flow like this. I've got a time source, 
a transformer that does something, and a log uh, sync. So this is probably the most simple, uh, this is the hello world equivalent of uh, Spring Cloud Stream. What Spring Cloud Stream does is if each one of these is a microservice, it abstracts out the red. It ab abstracts out the communication hops between those, those components. It does this via an implementation of what's called a binder. A binder is the uh, method of communication between these uh, different microservices. Out of the box right now, we support, we support Kafka, Rabbit. Um, we're working with Google on a Google PubSub one. Uh, there was one other one. Yeah. Like everything in Spring, we make it difficult to consume this. Basically drop that annotation on there, on your code with the appropriate stereotype, and everything works. There are three different stereotypes. There's a source, a processor, and a sync. Like everything within the Spring framework, um, this is stuff that is, while the Spring Cloud Stream itself is a thin wrapper on Spring integration, Spring integration and everything below it is a, as you all know, is a battle-tested set of frameworks. They've been in the industry for 10 plus years, so this isn't a framework that a pair of college kids developed in their dorm room uh, as part of their PhD thesis and as I was trying to get the whole world to use. These are, th these are technologies that have been around and are, are robust. Some use cases for Spring Cloud Stream. So data ingestion, um, data transformation, real-time data processing, as well as IoT. I actually used uh, Spring Cloud Stream a couple of years ago to, to uh, develop a demo application where we actually did a connected car. Uh, we actually had people driving around in cities when I did the talk, and we would predict, uh, we would ingest data live from a car using Spring Cloud Stream. Let's take, a quick let's take a quick look at what Spring Cloud Stream looks like. I'll go ahead and run the code, and then we'll look at the actual, uh, look at the actual code in just a second. So we're gonna do the equivalent of that hello world. And unlike Josh and Mark who are amazing at live coding, I am not, so I copy and paste. So I'm gonna kick off two Spring Boot applications. The first one is my source. And just like everything within Spring Boot, it's, they start up the same way. Java-jar, the name of my jar file, and any properties I need to pass along. For Spring Cloud Stream, there is really two main properties you need to worry about. For a, sor for a source, I configure spring.cloud.stream.binding.output destination. For a sync, I'm gonna configure .input destination. And for a processor, I'll configure both, input and output. So this is the time source. I'm gonna use Rabbit for my middleware, which I probably should start. So I'll go ahead and start the uh, time source. And then while that's starting up, I'll get the commands in place for the log sync, which is the other piece of this. And so you can see the messages are coming across once a second. They're being picked up by the sync. I can go ahead and kill the source. Time stops. I can go ahead and start back up again. It starts up again. If I want, I can even scale this, in theory, by running two. Let's say generating time once a second isn't good enough for me. I can actually run two. Now we should get two messages a second in just a second. So now you can see I've scaled the one to uh, my source to two. And again, I can kill them independently. And then it stops completely. That makes sense from a, how that works perspective. Let's go ahead and actually look at what this looks like in code. So I've got a transformer that I'll, that I'll stick in here in just a second. 
since we're all Spring developers, this class should look pretty straightforward. It's the traditional way of starting Spring Boot. This is where the interesting stuff is. So at configuration, this is my configuration class, at enable binding processor. So this is going to be a processor. Um, the only other piece here that is of interest is this at transformer annotation. This is the traditional spring integration at transformer. There's nothing special here. This isn't new for spring cloud stream. But instead of having to figure out, okay, what is my input channel? What is my output channel? Do I need to inject properties here to figure out what the names are? I don't care about any of that anymore. I just do processor.input and processor.output. If this was a, if this was a uh, source, um, I'd be using a different annotation, but the, the output channel would be uh, source. Uh, output, and if it was a sync, it'd be uh, sync.input. And then here, all I'm doing is, uh, in this transformer, I am accepting the time that I received from the time source. I'm going to log it just so you can see that we are getting a unique message each time. And then I'm going to change it to it's 5 o'clock somewhere. So if I stick this in between those two uh, processors, the, the source and sync we just looked at, I should have nothing really logging in the source. This will log out the input time that it receives and then kick out a message that it will see in the logs that says it's five o'clock somewhere over and over. Go ahead and run this really quick. So I'll start off my time source again. You'll notice this time the output destination is called five o'clock input. Now it runs. Now I'll go ahead and kick off my transformer. And on this one, you'll notice I have to configure, again, both the input destination is five o'clock input and the output dot destination is five o'clock output. The other thing, I, other thing I'm configuring here is server dot port. Um, each one of these microservices uh, also includes the embedded Tomcat for actuator endpoints and, and health and that stuff. And since I'm all running this locally, I need to make sure I don't have port conflicts. So that'll be the processor and then the sync. And so we can already see in the processor, it's already receiving messages from the source. So I'm logging out the unique time each time. And then, this guy sounds like it actually looks better. You can see it's transforming to it's five o'clock somewhere over and over. Does that make sense to everyone? Pretty straightforward. Cool. So that's Spring Cloud Stream. Um, let's move on to Spring Cloud Task. So when we think about microservices, typically our mind goes to the REST endpoints that Josh and Mark just demoed or um, that you've probably seen throughout the rest of this conference. But in even these me message-based microservices, there's one key characteristic of both of those styles, which is if they stop, it's typically a bad thing. If they go down, typically, and I'm going to show my age here, typically you might get a page in the middle of the night uh, and you need to fix something, right? But not all workloads fall nicely into that never-ending style, right? Batch processing is still a very valid uh, use case within the enterprise. And that's what Spring Cloud Task specifically targets. It targets microservices that have an expected or defined endpoint. Some of the uh, features of Spring Cloud Task. It's got a task repository. If you're familiar with Spring Batch, it's a crude version of the job repository in Spring Batch. We'll look at the main fields here, um, but basically it tracks um, the run, so start, end time, the results, if an exception happened, what the exception was, all those types of things. There's integration with Spring Batch. So in two capacities. Number one, informational messages. So as a job starts or finishes, as a step starts or finishes, you can emit informational messages uh, that are actually emitted via Spring Cloud Stream that you can consume that way. As well as the ability to uh, launch workers within a partition step uh, as tasks. So historically, if you want to do partitioning within Spring Batch, you had two, two ways. You could either do it in process with threads, or you could do it external processes with workers essentially sitting out there waiting for work, and then when they received the work, they did the work, and then they would still sit waiting. The problem with that, though, is all those JVMs had to be sitting there eating up resources 
let's say, all day, even though they're only going to be used, let's say, for a couple hours. Spring Cloud Task provides a new partition handler that allows you to launch those workers as tasks. So now nothing is running out there. I get to the step. I determine I need five partitions. I'm going to launch five workers. They'll do their work and shut down. So you finally get that cloud-like elasticity within a batch job. And then finally, stream integration. Those messages I mentioned, both for Spring Batch uh, applications as well as just the, like the start and finish and error within a Spring Cloud task, all those are emitted via Spring Cloud streams. You can also launch tasks via streams. We've got a launcher that will receive a message and it'll launch a task for you. Again, like everything within Spr Spring, we make it hard to use. Drop on that annotation on your app and you get pretty much all the rest for free. Again, just like with Spring Cloud Stream, this is, a, well, it's a new, uh, a new framework. All the concepts and all the basics here are built on things that have been around for over a decade. Some common use cases, so wrapping your apps in batch jobs, or wrapping your batch jobs in tasks, um, getting both those informational messages, the elasticity on partitioning. One-off processes. Let's say you want to do a database migration. And you need to do it in off hours, so that means the middle of the night. Um, you get two options there, right? You get to either babysit it yourself or hand it off to somebody and hope they do it right. Or you can do it as a Spring Cloud task, schedule it, and then if it does fail for some reason, you can actually either act on it or you can wait till the morning and see within the, the task repository what happened. Um, so those types of uh, processes work well in this new task environment. ETL processing, so the typical uh, moving data around when you have finite amounts of data. Any other finite processing, including data science. So if you have, let's say, a batch model that you need to train uh, that is then later injected into a stream processing, uh, Spring Cloud Tasks is a good example for using that. We actually did something similar with, again, going back to that connected car demo. Um, the use case was uh, we were predicting where a car was going, and then based on that, how the range uh, they would get based on their current uh, uh, gas in the tank, and the batch training for uh, the data science piece of it was done via Spring Cloud Task. Let's look at a, the hello world of Spring Cloud Task. I'll show you the code first on this one. So again, it's got the same Spring Boot bootstrapping class. Skip over that. And I'm really not configuring it. It is just dropping in at enable task. It's really all you need to do. So I've got the at configuration, at enable task, and then I've got this command line runner. So Spring Boot provides two different ways of, of bootstrapping logic within uh, a container outside of just creating a bean, and that is a command line runner or an application runner. When a boot application starts, it looks in, within the context and runs all of those that it finds. You can order them with the ordered annotation, et cetera. So, what a Spring Cloud task really is, is it's the run of a Spring Boot application, and the start of the task is considered right before any of these command line runners run, and it's complete when they've all finished. So in this case, I've implemented my own custom command line runner. All it's going to do is do system.out.println, and then to display the uh, recording of the stack trace within the uh, database, I'm also going to throw an exception. So when I run this, it's supposed to fail. That's the idea. Now, this, is, this example, obviously, I'm writing my own command line runner, but you don't even need to in a lot of cases. If you're running a batch job as a Spring Cloud task, the way batch jobs are run with Spring Boot by default is done via a command line runner. So we've already provided that for you. So this, actually running, writing this piece of code, you may not even need to do. Let's go and run this guy. Actually, let me first... Just so there's nothing on my sleeve. I haven't set this up in advance. So we'll go ahead and do the task. Oops. Okay. And then this task obviously doesn't take any properties. So Java dash jar, name of the task. I've already configured the database within a properties file in there. You can use things like uh, cloud config though as well. 
So let's start off at the top because that's where some of the interesting stuff is. So I've got debug logging turned on here, and we can see before my command line before my command line runner is run, there's this creating task execution. That's the actual creation within the task repository of the of the start of my execution. So I've got uh, my ID, exit code is null since I'm just starting it, I've got a name, I've got a start time, end time is null, exit message null, and I didn't pass any arguments. Then I've got my system dot to println, and then as expected, the exception got thrown. We can go down to the bottom. That's gonna hurt. And then here, we've got the updating uh, task execution. So this is the task failed, we're actually gonna persist the information. So we've got an, e we've got an exit code now of, of one, we've got an end time, we have an exit message, which is the stack trace from the, uh, from my exception. And now if we take a look, we can see we've got the, the uh, tables were created, and if I do select star on task execution, You can see this all in the database where it's available whenever we need it. The other tables here are task execution, that's what we just looked at. Execution parameters, so if you pass in any command line args to your task, we'll, re we'll persist these there. Um, and then since my SQL doesn't support sequences, that's what the sequence one is for. And then if you run a batch job within Spring Cloud Task, the task task batch is actually um, just a join table that allows you to link the tables from the Spring Batch repository to the Spring Cloud Task repository as well. Does that make sense? Pretty straightforward. Cool. Which brings us to Spring Cloud Dataflow. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Spring XD, Dataflow is really XD 2.0. It's new and improved. Um, Unlike Spring XD, which was a container-based uh, model, you deployed these, you install these containers on servers and we manage all that stuff, Dataflow takes a cloud-native uh, approach to all of this. Um, building on, X, on XD, uh, we realized that uh, there was a lot of the management aspects and the HA aspects that we were having to redevelop ourselves. So did a container go down? If it did, what do we do? Do we restart it? What apps get restarted and all that kind of stuff? Yet, modern platforms like Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes and so forth already do all that stuff for us. So we decided to, instead of rebuilding that ourselves, like actually a lot of the Hadoop ecosystem does, we decided to embrace those and use those as our runtime. So Cl Spring Cloud Dataflow takes advantage of those runtimes, specifically Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, Mesos, and Yarn. We also have a local version that's for development only. But what is Spring Cloud Dataflow itself? it actually orchestrates these microservices. So you just saw me typing java-jar, passing in specific properties to wire this stuff together. Spring Cloud Dataflow handles that for you. It does the java-jar and makes sure all those properties are set correctly for the things to do what they're supposed to do. There's a few different ways of interacting with Spring Cloud Dataflow. There's an interactive shell, there's a web-based UI, and sit it, th both of those sit on top of a set of RESTful endpoints that you can consume yourself. This is actual executable code within Spring Cloud Dataflow. This goes back to the, that orchestrational coverage that I talked about earlier at this level. So here we've got a DSL that allows you to orchestrate these microservices. In this case, this is the definition of a stream. We've got an HTTP source, a filter, and then an, H an HTFS sync. What this would do is this would open port 9000 for a, and listen to HTTP traffic pass it to a filter, I left out the configuration args for the filter, but imagine a spell expression there, uh, just deciding what to filter on, and then anything that gets through the filter would be written out to a file on HTFS. When you look at this stream, the pieces in red are the same pieces in red from that previous Spring Cloud stream diagram. Those are the network hops. So those are the pieces that are actually the binders, and the pieces in between are the individual microservices. So unlike Spring XD, there are no containers to install for any of this stuff. Everything is Spring Boot-based. The, the Dataflow server is boot-based, the interactive shell is a boot application, and all of the out-of-the-box, as well as most of the uh, microservices that you'll develop, are all boot-based. For the record, that does not mean that they have to be boot-based. 
Um, Spring Cloud Dataflow also supports uh, Docker images, specifically for Kubernetes, but in general. Um, so if you had, let's say, a Python processor, if you're doing some kind of data science, you can also go that route as well. From a topology perspective, this is kind of what Dataflow looks like. So you've got the Dataflow server in the center. It uses a, a, a data store for a couple things. Uh, it uses a relational data store to store some metadata about stream definitions, application location, that kind of thing. Um, as well as it also uses the, that data store for the task repository as well as batch repository if you're using uh, either one of those features. Off to the right, we've got both the shell and the uh, UI. Both of those communicate in the same way to the uh, Dataflow server via the REST endpoints. And then the rest of that is just apps that it's running. It's important to realize that Dataflow, all it does is it runs applications. So unlike, let's say, Apache NiFi or some of the other big data uh, options, Dataflow Server itself doesn't do any of the work here. So I could, in theory, launch Dataflow, de de define a stream, deploy it, and then shut Dataflow back down, and that's okay. The work will st still keep going, the JVMs will keep running, everything will still, st all the work will continue to be done. If we look at, a, at a, an example of uh, how this looks from an actual stream perspective, let's take a look at this stream. So I'm going to do some ingestion of Twitter data. So I'll ingest, uh, I've got a Twitter source. I'll ingest it to a file, so I'll just write it out to a file. And then I'll do a wiretap, and I'll also send those values to a key value uh, counter. And we'll essentially count hashtags. What this looks like within the data flow world is everything's the same. The only difference is, from Dataflow's perspective, it has to launch three apps. It launches those three apps with the right properties, and everything else just kind of works. Does that make sense? Go ahead and look at it in action. So I'll start off by go ahead and launching the Dataflow server itself. Again, just a boot jar. So Java dash jar, the name of the jar file. And while that's starting, I'll get the shell going as well. That's up and running. Oops. So here's the shell. Um, it's got tab complete, so if, if you don't know what to do, hit tab, it'll probably tell you what to do. And to start off, we need to register our applications. Like I said, Dataflow orchestrates these applications. It's responsible for launching them, but it needs to know where to get the bits from in order to launch them in the first place. So we need to register our applications. So if I see I have no apps registered right now, so I'll go ahead and register my three applications. So I'll register my Twitter source, app, register, type is source, name, I'll call it Twitter. And then the URI is basically the coordinates of where to get those bits. I'm using Maven coordinates. You could use file, HDFS, like I said, Docker containers, et cetera. So that's the source. Then I've got my file sync. And then my field value countersink. So now you can see I've got those three apps registered. So let's go ahead and actually deploy them, but I'll do it the sexy way with a browser. Oops. So this is the uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow UI. Can everyone read that in the back? OK, thanks. So I'll walk through the tabs. The first tab is the Apps tab. That is basically showing the exact same thing I just did in the shell. I can register these applications here as well. It's just easier for me to copy and paste in the shell. I've got a Runtime tab. This will show me all of my applications that are running and the number of instances that are running. Um, as well as their state. We'll be looking at this as we deploy our streams. As I deploy streams, I, we'll do that here. So we'll create our stream definitions. There's a cool 
uh, drag and drop UI that you can use to create these streams. On the task side, this is uh, if, you were, if we were going to be running tasks here, uh, you can both define tasks here as well as look at the executions. So the execution tab is essentially a UI for the MySQL database that I, we were looking at earlier. Since running Spring Batch jobs within the scope of a task is a common use case, we actually have a tab dedicated for that as well. Um, again, that's just a really just a, a view into uh, the, the Spring Batch job repository. We've got an analytics tab, which is uh, good for doing some very basic visualizations on some of the analytics that we can do. We'll, do. we'll look at this in just a minute as well. And then finally, an about page. So let's go ahead and actually create our stream. So I'm going to drag my Twitter source. I want these to auto link. I'm lazy. And I'm going to file sync. And you'll notice as I do that, this text up here is, is editing. Um, this is actually bi directional. So I can. If I delete stuff out of here, it goes away. And let's say somebody gives me uh, a stream definition from production, and it's really long and complicated, and I need to just visually wrap my head around what's going on here. I can just paste it right in, and it'll visualize it for, you, for me. Um, let's see. Grab. I want to grab one thing, which is the path to the file that we're going to actually write to. So I want to configure that property. Go here. So we'll go ahead and create the stream. And you get two options here. You can either just create it and deploy it later, or you can deploy it real time. And we're going to go ahead and deploy it real time. So I want to grab the name so I get the right address. Deploy streams. And go ahead and create. Forgive me. Let me bounce. Let me make sure I got the right. Oh, helps me grab the right one. Let's try that again, shall we? I'll have to re-register my apps, but give me a sec. Source. Sync. Sorry about this. What do you get for using the wrong versions? So if we go back here, refresh, apps are registered, stream. Stream, Twitter, auto link, file. There we go, that's much better. So now I need to grab that URL again for the location. Uh, let's go back pretty quickly. Oh, wrong throw, wrong sync. I want the file. We'll do file. You're this guy. Why can't you find the file? Okay, so we'll skip the field value counter. Sorry about this. Close source. Deploy counter. All right, so that's got the right stuff. Uh, up. Field name. So 
So this stream that we're going to create is actually, I'm skipping the file because for some reason I can't find my file source. But what it's going to do is it's going to ingest tweets and count the hashtags that go along with it that are in there. So let me grab the right name of it. Tweets count. Go ahead and deploy it. And so if we go to runtime, we can see that it's deploying the applications. I've got one of each being launched. Give a minute to start up. They're both deployed, so I should be now ingesting Twitter data. Um, we can go ahead and in the sh shell, we can take a look. I don't have, now I have a field value counter. This is all being persisted to Redis by default. Um, we can view it. And these are the actual hashtags coming through. Um, I probably should preface this um, that uh, this is live Twitter data, so if there's anything inappropriate, please don't hold me responsible. Um, so as you can see, we're ingesting this real time. Um, in fact, we can even do a vi cool visualization here. We can go to analytics. I can select my field value counters. I can do my field value counter. And there's a couple different options here, so the bubble chart is the one we'll use. Um, and then you can see as this, as we ingest the data, this bubble map updates with the data being ingested live. And again, data flow itself is just orchestrating this up, stuff. So you can see I actually have uh, the, two, the two just plain jar files are my data flow server and my shell. Then you can see I've got the Twitter stream uh, app running and the field value counter. All is independent JVM. So in a cloud, these would be independent applications uh, on your cloud as well. Does that make sense to everybody? So there's a whole laundry list of this, what, what can happen in this ecosystem. There is, um, we actually do an eight-hour uh, workshop on, this, on all these different projects, and obviously I don't want to bore you guys for that long. Uh, <laughs> but I want you to be aware of some of the other features that are available in this ecosystem. Uh, we talked briefly about how there is that integration between task, batch, and stream integration, but I didn't demo demonstrate any of it, so just still be aware that that exists. Um, partition streams is another aspect uh, that Spring Cloud Stream handles. So if you have stateful processors for your streams and need to partition your, uh, let's say your Kafka stream, uh, or your Kafka topic, um, that's supported. Um, as well as both scaling these. We looked at this briefly when I deployed two sources, um, but the scaling capabilities both within Spring and Task, uh, those features are available. The current state of things, so Spring Cloud Stream, Chelsea SR2 is the current one with uh, Ditmars coming out later this year. Uh, Spring Cloud Task, 1.2 came out, uh, about two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, um, with 1.3 probably in Q4. And Spring Cloud Dataflow, 1.2 is the current with 2.0 coming out in Q4. Questions? Otherwise, that's all I've got. Thanks, everyone.